Okay, so for our next example, we're considering the graph, um, and that is this vertical line straight up and down. But again, since it's a vertical line, if I put my paper on that particular line, notice that it touches that line everywhere. Um, so this would not be a function. Vertical lines are never considered a function because they would never pass the vertical line test since this one value of x corresponds to every value of y. And our rule is that, that one, the x can only correspond to one value of our y. Now, as far as the domain, remember again, domain is what values along this x-axis are being used by our graph. Well, in this particular instance, there's only one value being used by our x's, and that is the value 2. That's the number that this line sits on as far as our x value is concerned. Well, the way that we're going to write that with our domain is we're going to say that x equals 2. That's the only value that we're being used in our x's is that one value 2. Now, for our range, remember our range is our y values. So if we're looking at this from um, 0 and we're, more, we're working our way down, notice it's going to continue to go down and down and down and forever and ever, which means it's going to use all of these x, or excuse me, all of these y values along this y axis. Well, the same thing is true as we move up from 0 all the way up here. This is all positive infinity, and it's going to continue to use all of those positive y values as the graph goes up. So our range here would be all real numbers. So again, asking ourselves, is this a function? If I take my handy dandy piece of paper here and I sweep across my function from right to left, notice that my piece of paper only touches my blue graph one time. So this indeed is a function. Now, as I think about moving from the left to the right across my x-axis, notice that my graph continues to drop down. So for all of these x-axis, x values across here, I will have a spot on my graph. The same thing is true as I think about all these positive x values across my x-axis. They all have a spot along my line. So my domain here, again, would be all real numbers. And our range, again, thinking about our up and down movement as we go along our y-axis. As we move down, on our x's, notice again my graph is dropping down as it goes, so all of these y values would have a corresponding point on my graph. Same thing as I move up my graph, all of these y values would have a corresponding point on my graph, so again my range would be all real numbers. Anytime I have a straight line like I do here, um, not a vertical line, but just a nice straight line like this, my domain and range are going to be all real numbers because everything is going to get used by that one graph. Alright, so for our last question about domain and range, this one is actually going to take us in three steps. The first step wants us to list the ordered pairs, um, and so notice that we've got one over here and then that's our A and then B, C, and D are all listed over here. So let's start with A, so we'll do it in order. Um, I'm going to go ahead and label these um, A, B, and C so you can see what values we're looking at. So I've got A here. going to start. Um, let's see our X value for our A. It looks like it's going to be negative 7, so we have negative 7, comma, that is, looks like negative 8. Okay, for our B value, B is right here, so that looks like it's going to be 9, and then down 1, 2, 3, so that's going to be 9, comma, 3. For C, also looks like it's on that X value of 9, so that's going to be 9, oops, by the way, that should be 9, comma, negative 3, and since I'm going down, it should be 9, comma, negative 1. And then for our D, Looks like that's only going over 8 and then down 2. So this would be a positive 8 and a negative 2. So the next question is asking us to find the domain and range. Well, remember that domain here is your x values. So all we have to do to find our domain is list all of our x values present. So we're going to use um, a curly brace since we are doing this in what we call set notation. 
So we're just going to start with our smallest value first. We're going to do negative 7, and then I'm going to do 8 for my D, and then 9. And I don't want to list 9 twice. I realize that 9 is for both B and C, but I only want to list um, the points, the X values one time, even if there is a repeater. So now we're going to do the same thing for our range. We're going to do our curly brace. Again, we want to start with our smallest number. That would be negative 8. And then looks like we've got negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and that would be our range. Now the, the third and last question is asking us if this is a function. Well remember what the function is, that there's only one, for every x there's only one y. Well look at b and c. Notice that they have the exact same x value but they have different y values. That's a problem. We can't have one x value that corresponds to two different numbers. So this particular example is not a function. Again, if you look back up at the original graph, I'm just going to slide this back up here, you'll notice that right along this value 9, you've got two points that line up on that vertical line. And we can't have that. That's not passing our vertical line test that we talked about earlier. Okay, so what we're going to talk about next is something called function notation, and this is just a different way to talk about evaluating an expression, um, and it just provides us with a lot of information. So one of the things I just wanted to kind of label some stuff for you so when you look at it you understand what's going on. This letter F, that's nothing fancy, that's just what we call the name of the function. And now for what you're going to see in your homework, they're going to always use the letter F for S, and it's the most common letter used for a function since function starts with the letter F. However, we can use pretty much any letter of the alphabet. You'll see G used a lot, as well as H, even sometimes R. It just depends on what, um, what the person writing the function feels like using. Again, it doesn't always have to be F, but um, it's probably the most common. So this x inside this parentheses, this is basically your input, okay? This is what you're going to plug in to your x of the function, okay? Now you might say, what do you mean plug that in? What I'm talking about is down here. You notice that I have f of x, and by the way, that is how that is said. This is f at x. That's how we say that. Okay, this is, um, and we have it equal to this 3x plus 4. This 3x plus 4 is basically your rule or what you are doing to x. Okay, and then f at x, this is your output. Okay. This is what is your function doing? What, what answer did you get when you plugged in whatever number we plugged in for x? Okay, so let's try an example. Alright, so consider the following function. It's giving us our function right up here. It's telling us that f of x is equal to 4x plus 9. And then in step 1 it wants to us to evaluate 4 I mean, excuse me, f at 4. So this letter 4, this is what we want to plug in to x, okay? So when we say we want to do f at 4, we want to take this number 4 and we want to plug that in for the x in that 4x plus 9. So we want to say 4 times 4 plus 9. Notice that I didn't write the x anymore because I'm actually substituting the number 4 in for the letter x. And think about when you substitute a player on a basketball court. That doesn't mean I now have six players on the court. I've got to take somebody off. And the same thing here. I'm taking the x off the court. I'm plugging the 4 in. Now the biggest thing you have to remember here when we're doing function notation and evaluation is I'm not solving an equation. I am simply simplifying what I have here. So I need to simplify down the right hand side. I'm going to use my order of operation which means I'm going to do this multiplication first. So that gives me 16 plus 9. Then I'm going to add 16 plus 9. That's going to give us 25. And you can just kind of bring this f at 4 down. So f at 4 equals 25. This is my statement that I want to have 
for this particular evaluation. And the reason that we do it this way is because it gives us a whole bunch of information. First of all, I'm using the letter f, so I know that I'm looking at this function up here where I said f of x was equal to 4x plus 9. The second thing I know is I know that I plugged in the number 4 into this function and that gave me 25. So it just gives you a lot of information as what you plugged in and what your answer was. So we're going to do the same thing on step two, just a little bit bigger plug in here. We're going to plug in a plus two. So this entire statement, a plus two, is going to plug, we're going to plug that in for x. So we're going to say f at a plus two, and that is going to equal. Now I still have my four as part of my function, so I've got four times a plus 2 because that's what I'm plugging in for my x and then plus 9 because again that's part of my original function up here with my 4x plus 9. Now all I have to do now is just simplify this down so the first thing I want to do in simplification is always distribute my parentheses so I'm going to multiply through by 4 which is going to give me 4a plus 8 plus 9 and then of course I want to take and add this 8 and 9 together since those are like terms, they're both constants. So that would give me 4a plus 17. And then again I'm just going to bring this guy down and say f at a plus 2 is equal to 4a plus 17. Okay, so for our next example, again, I'm defining f of x up here at the top, and f of x is equal to 5x cubed plus 4x, and at first I want to find f at negative 2, so again, all I'm doing is everywhere I see an x in my function, which is in these two places, I'm going to substitute the number negative 2, so I'm going to have 5 times negative 2 cubed plus 4 times negative 2. Now my order of operation says that I need to do this exponent first, so I need to do negative 2 cubed. Remember this is multiplying negative 2 times itself three times. So that's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. And that is going to give us negative 8, so 5 times negative 8 plus 4 times negative 2. So now that we've got the exponent out of the way, we can actually do both of these multiplications at the same time since they are separated with an addition sign. So we can do 5 times negative 8, which would give us negative 40. We can do positive 4 times negative 2, which would give us a negative 8. And then we've got negative 40 minus 8. That's going to give us a negative 48. And so we would bring down our f at negative 2 and that would equal negative 48. Again, remember, you're not solving anything with these problems, you're just evaluating and it's just whatever number is inside of that parentheses or whatever letter is inside of that parentheses, you're substituting that in for x. So now we're going to do the same thing on our second one, but look at the, what we're finding. We're finding f at a. Again, we're still using that same function up here that we were given at the beginning of the problem, the 5x cubed plus 4x, but now we're going to plug in an a everywhere we see an x. So that means we would have 5a cubed plus 4 a. And unlike our previous example, there's really nothing to do at this point. We can't really simplify a cubed. We don't know what a is. It's just a cubed. And we can't add 5a cubed and 4a because they're not like terms. So that would be our answer. We would be done.